have three very interesting papers here today, um, spanning from um, um, across Europe all the way to the Balkans and eventually down to Southeast Europe in Greece uh, from the 17th century all the way to the 20th. Um, I will be starting by giving the floor to Dimitar Iliev from the University of Sofia. Um, I really like the title of your presentation. That's um, the opening um, sentence from one of my favorite books, The Past is a Foreign Country, by the, it's, um, it's uh, from the uh, Go Between by uh, L.P. Hartley. So uh, Dimitar will be talking to us about the digital rediscovery of the 19th century documents from the Metropolitan Sea of Philippopolis. We will be taking your questions um, at the chat box throughout the session. Um, each presentation will be lasting 12 minutes. Um, I will be letting you know um, when you have two more minutes and then um, I think we are now ready to start. Dimitar, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, the purpose of my presentation is to present to you the uh, ongoing activities in the framework of our uh, CLADA National Consortium, which uh, uh, contributes to uh, DARIA EU, uh, concerning the uh, rediscovery of uh, the 19th century documents from the Metropolitan Sea of uh, Philippopolis. So, some uh, preliminary words about the Metropolitan Sea of uh, uh, Philippopolis and uh, also uh, what the documents are. First of all, you see here a map of Bulgaria, the uh, Metropolitan Seas of Bulgarian Orthodox Church, and here you see uh, in, uh, in red the Metropolitan Sea of uh, Philippopolis, or uh, today's uh, Plovdiv in uh, Bulgaria. Uh, which is the center of uh, uh, this uh, uh, eparchy. Uh, the, the sea was, uh, has a very, very uh, rich and long history. According to church tradition, it was established by the Apostle Hermas in uh, 36 uh, AD. So uh, at least according to uh, ecclesiastical tradition, this is uh, uh, quite, uh, mm, quite ancient. Uh, uh, metropolitan. Uh, it's, it has been a part of the ecumenical, ecumenical patriarchate in Constantinople, uh, a part of the Bulgarian exarchy, and is currently a part of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, so at least three different uh, church uh, entities, Orthodox Church entities. Uh, and uh, in uh, addition to that, uh, as you can see, the territory of uh, uh, the sea is uh, uh, covers a large part of the ex-Roman province of uh, uh, Thrace in today's southern Bulgaria. And uh, important historical centers uh, are in it. Here you see the, the, the city of uh, Plovdiv or Philippopolis, which is uh, quite a significant and multicultural center and always has been. But uh, it also uh, has on its territory um, centers such as the Byzantine Bachkovo Monastery, established by uh, uh, Byzantine officials of uh, Georgian origin in 11th century, and one of the uh, crucial monuments and uh, sites of uh, uh, Byzantine, post-Byzantine and church uh, heritage in uh, Bulgaria. And uh, also on the territory of the Sea of uh, Philippopolis are Mm, to be found uh, cities like uh, Stanimaka or Stenimachos or today's Asenovgrad, which you see here on this picture, which were uh, thriving industrial and trade uh, centers, uh, crucial for the um, trade uh, in the uh, Ottoman Empire uh, between, uh, between uh, Thrace and uh, uh, Constantinople and uh, uh, Asia Minor and the Aegean Basin. Uh, this is why uh, the documents uh, from the uh, Metropolitan Sea uh, are um, of great importance uh, for studying the history, not only of uh, what is uh, today's Bulgaria, but uh, also of the social economical history of the uh, late uh, Ottoman Empire with, uh, in, in connection with uh, the, um, the history of at least 
uh, at least uh, two other um, contemporary Balkan countries, uh, such as uh, Greece and uh, Turkey. What are the documents itself? Actually, uh, the documents are the so-called kondiki, in Bulgarian kondika, or in Greece, in Greek codex or kodikas, which comes from the Latin codex. And actually, this is one written volume. You see here, there's four of them. Uh, that encompasses handwritten, uh, encompasses different entries. And we are currently working on, at the first stage of the project, on the first volume of uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, big colites, uh, which encompasses the period from approximately 1792 to 1841. There are different types of entries in, uh, in uh, a volume like this. There's, of course, uh, uh, the accounting entries, inventory lists, documents for donations, contracts, divorce papers, uh, entries concerning different appointments and salaries, not only of uh, clerks to the uh, to the sea itself, but uh, for example, uh, teachers to the Greek school in Plovdiv, lists of books which are um, part of the donations, but uh, are a very interesting uh, item in itself uh, because they show what uh, uh, Greek language education in uh, uh, the schools of Philippopolis was at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, and uh, different documents like this, all encompassed into one volume, of which you see here a specimen, courtesy of uh, the um, um, Metropolitan Sea of Plovdiv. Uh, what do we do with these documents? Here you see the different activities and, of course, the people who conduct these activities and their affiliations, which you can relate accordingly with uh, the uh, topic of this, uh, this year's annual event to different types of scholarly primitives, which are all encompassed into the research and publication and the modeling of uh, the same item. First, there's the reading, transcript, transcription, and translation from the Greek. Mm, you see here the, the team of uh, people who uh, conducts it. Uh, secondly, there's editing of the transcription and the translation, together with historical comment commentary to this, the, mm, the creation of uh, different sorts of uh, paratexts. Uh, accompanying the main text of uh, the, uh, uh, the volume. There's, of course, the electronic annotation. And there's an IT support which uh, will help with the um, online publication of the document as an online edition, uh, which is uh, to, be, uh, to be published as a, uh, uh, as a separate site. First, there's dealing with the original text, which is in uh, extremely uh, peculiar uh, handwriting and uh, in a um, very peculiar uh, language, uh, 19th century Greek, which is uh, uh, something uh, somewhere in between the, uh, 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 the church Katareus, which is uh, 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 which uh, inherits uh, the main features of uh, Byzantine Greek and uh, also the spoken Greek language of the day, uh, together with uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, Turkish and uh, uh, Bulgarian uh, names and uh, loan words. So this is a very important, I would say, a crucial part of uh, uh, working with, uh, with the documents, mm. uh, which is at the same time, the primary digitization of the text because uh, uh, the reading, reading the text also uh, encompasses uh, its uh, uh, turning, its uh, transcription into uh, digital, into a uh, machine-readable uh, text form, uh, and uh, some work on uh, the normalization 
of uh, some forms is to uh, is to follow if we want uh, uh, all the peculiarities of the text to be properly uh, indexed, as you will see in a while. Uh, the second stage of the work, which is uh, now uh, almost uh, complete, is the translation and the commentary to the original text, the translation in, uh, in uh, Bulgarian, and a very detailed and very thorough uh, historical commentary uh, together uh, with uh, the relevant uh, bibliography, which uh, sheds additional light on the uh, people and uh, events and institutions mentioned uh, in the uh, in the volume. And after that, what uh, we are now trying to uh, we are now trying to conceptualize and to model is the semantic annotation of the text itself and of its translation. You for have that two, purpose, more, two more minutes, Dimitar. For that purpose, we are uh, we are using uh, we are using the uh, inception um, annotation uh, software. Here, uh, you see some uh, uh, you see an example of uh, uh, what uh, we are doing with uh, with the text. Uh, there, you can uh, annotate and tag uh, different uh, entities um, and their uh, relations. Uh, this annotation serves a double purpose. On the one hand, this uh, annotation will be then used to be incorporated in the knowledge graph uh, for uh, uh, historical and cultural heritage objects, which is currently being elaborated uh, in the framework of the CLADA BG National Consortium. So there's the raw material which uh, goes to be further uh, modeled for uh, the inner research community of our consortium. And after an export in XML, we are planning to prepare an online edition of the text. What is the concept of this online edition? What it will be like? Uh, we think we, uh, the best way to present it is parallel aligned Greek and Bulgarian texts to uh, all the entries together with mm, notes which uh, pop up additionally, uh, which are to the Bulgarian text, and also uh, marked up uh, named entities and uh, uh, other things in the original text, as well as in parallel uh, in, the, uh, in the translation. Mm. And then automatic extraction of uh, the everything that is uh, marked up in the text uh, uh, to create uh, uh, indices and bibliographies to the text. And the nodes themselves, when applicable, will also be supplied by uh, different kinds of uh, images that uh, will Dimitar, serve. Dimitar, please, your time, your time is up. I'm so sorry. You have to wrap up. OK. So the uh, tax set, which uh, we are now elaborating, what we need to what we need to do is to be able to annotate people, places, events, dates, period, institutions, quantities and numbers, measures and currencies. And then we have, in addition to these semantic tags, we have structural tags, which will help us with the uh, alignment uh, of the corpora, uh, entries, paragraphs, pages, and different tables. And the value of all this is to make widely available an important and unknown, previously unknown historical document uh, about the history of Greeks and Bulgarians in Plovdiv, to present the mixture of languages, cultures, and identities in 19th century Filipopolis or Plovdiv, uh, which is uh, little known, to provide a different angle from the most, uh, an angle which is different from the most widely available historical narrative about this uh, period, uh, at least in uh, Bulgaria, and uh, to give unknown details about the religious, cultural, industrial, and everyday life, which are not widely known to the public, and also identification of people, places, and events, which are previously unknown to the research community. Okay, sorry if I had prolonged my time. 
on the That's path. okay. Thank you so much, Dimitar. That's been um, very interesting um, in, in many ways. Um, I will swiftly move to our next speaker um, from the University of Basel, Sepide Alassin, on the e version of the Republic of Letters. Uh, so, without uh, further going into detail, I'm going to start. My topic of my presentation is the e version of the Republic of Letters. And so, our e version of the Republic of Letters is based on Bernoulli Euler Online. That's an infrastructure to present digital editions online in a machine readable format with research tools to study them. The primary idea of the BOL project is to create a virtual research environment that employs semantic web technologies to present historical data as an interconnected system of resources. In this way, every piece of information would be queryable. The advanced search tools of BOL platform allow researchers to channel their expertise into the analysis of the resources and their relations rather than a quest for them. Based on the work I present today, I suggest a new research method that I call the network method, which promotes the idea of studying historical data as a graph. BOL will contain all works and correspondence of members of Bernoulli dynasty, their disciples, and also Leonard Euler and his son, all of whom are, nat are natural philosophers originally from Basel. At the time being, Buell contains the entire scientific diary of Jacob Bernoulli and more than 1,500 letters of Bernoulli correspondence. The remaining thousands of letters of Bernoulli correspondence are currently under edition and will be gradually imported into the Buell platform. Euler's entire correspondence is being edited in the course of the last 100 years into 79 books, the last of which was supposed to appear this year postponed due to the corona situation. Buell currently contains only one of these books published in two volumes. That is Euler's correspondence with Christian Goldbach and two series of his correspondence with Turgut and Condorcet. The remaining editions of thousands of letters which are written or received by Euler and also those of his son, Johann Albrecht, will be gradually imported into the BUL platform. We have automatically converted the BUL into editions into XML. Then to be able to query every piece of information in the editions, we have modeled the data as RDF statements and stored them in triple store via Nora API. As a result, users can query for resources using metadata or full text search. In BUL, one can also search for a phrase with a certain markup or even resources that contain a specific index reference in their text. We have developed the BUL infrastructures in a generic form so that the data models and framework defined for the current editions can be used for integrating other editions into the BUL platform. BUL creates a small network of correspondence of Bernoulli's and Euler, but it's not enough for its historical research and a discipline. For example, my study on the mechanics of Jacob Bernoulli required studying the correspondence of others, such as Leibniz, Huygen, and Newton. Even though early modern natural philosophers either directly corresponded or mentioned each other's work, the outer-centric platforms that offer the digital editions of their correspondence do not interoperate, and editions are not linked. As a result, researchers have to visit various platforms to study the data and figure out their relations. Portals like MLO do an incredible job by pointing researchers to editions through metadata search. However, these portals do not give access to the data, and it's not possible to find sources by text queries. My idea was to extend the BUL network by connecting it to third-party repositories without centralizing data silos. As a first step, I have connected the Newton project and the brief portal Leibniz to the network. The resulting e-infrastructure available currently through the BUL platform gives full access to transcriptions and metadata of all editions included in the network. I aim to extend this network in the future by connecting it to other repositories. To connect repositories to the network, we need to rely on the most stable piece of information of the correspondence data, that means the metadata. In this example, you see the workflow of connecting the Newton project to the BUL. The metadata of Newton's scientific correspondence are modeled as RDF and connected to the BUL database. In this way, the advanced search tools of BUL could also be used to query Newton's correspondence. 
When a BOL user tries to access a letter that resides originally on the Neutron Project platform, the API fetches the textual transcription of the letter on the fly from the Neutron Project platform and displays it to the user together with the stored metadata information. Thus, we give users possibility to both query and access the letters that are part of the network through one single platform. In this way, the responsibility to maintain the textual data remains entirely in the hands of the project owning the data, like in this case, the Newton project, and they can update the transcriptions as they see fit without breaking anything in the network. Hence, the researchers using the network will always have access to the most up-to-date version of the transcriptions. The brief portal Leibniz is connected to the network in a similar way. Our platform also gives users a unique possibility to search for a term, phrase, and even a simple mathematical formula over the entire correspondence network through an asynchronous full-text search forwarding mechanism. When a user enters a phrase to be queried, the API searches for the term in all textual data of BOL repository and simultaneously forwards the text search request to search routes of brief portal Leibniz and the Newton project. When a repository returns the search result, it is immediately displayed to the user. When other repositories finalize their queries, their results are also displayed. At the time being, BOL platform is the portal to access the network of digital editions. In this platform, one can directly access Euler's correspondence, Jacob Bernoulli's Meditaciones notebook, Correspondence of Bernoulli's, you see a list of the, uh, them here, as well as resources from the Newton Project and the Brief Portal Leibniz. Using the advanced search tools of this platform, one can define search criteria over the entire network, for example, to search all letters in the network that are about eclipses. The search result contains multiple letters from different editions, for example, letters from Euler Goldbach correspondence, and also you see a letter from Newton's correspondence. Upon access, the content of Newton letter is fetched from the uh, fly and displayed to the user. A link takes readers to the representation of the letter on the Newton project platform. For my research, I was interested to find all entries in the network that contain the term velaria, which means curvature of a sail. A full text search for the Velaria returns all resources that contain this term, such as letters from Brief Portal Leibniz, entries in Jacob Bernoulli's diary, and a few bibliographical items where the term was mentioned in the title. Upon access, the content of letters from Brief Portal Leibniz are fetched and displayed, and a link takes users to the representation of the letter on the Brief Portal Leibniz. A picture tells a thousand words, so do the data visualizations. Visualizations intend to promote relational thinking by depicting the connections between the resources and drawing the researcher's attention to data distributions, irregularities, etc. It offers historians an overview of their research object so that they can recognize the relations between the items of knowledge. With the big picture in mind, they can better immerse themselves in detail. Modeling data with RDF-based OWL ontologies by default defines a directed graph where nodes are the resources and the properties the edges. Many digital humanities projects visualize the RDF graphs by flattening them into two dimensions. Although this kind of representation helps researchers with recognizing the direct and indirect connections between the resources, it suffers from loss of information due to the overlap of nodes and edges. One can overcome this problem by visualizing the data as 3D force-directed graphs. In our case, that's also web-based and interactive. In our platform, you can find a visualization for each correspondence edition. You can also see the graph of the entire network of editions. The virtual reality visualizations of data graphs are also available in web VR format. Here one can see the subgraph depicting the correspondence of members of Bernoulli dynasty. Light blue nodes represent letters and dark blue ones represent correspondence. Users can interact with this model by rotating it, zooming in and out, and accessing an underlying resource with a simple click on its node. 
The addition of Euler Goldbach correspondence con contains a hierarchical subject index in which letters are categorized with topics. I have visualized this correspondence series with respect to topics as a 3D web based interactive DAG Force tree in which yellow and blue nodes represent categories and light, light pink nodes represent letters. To Two study the to more. study the change or change of topic over time, I have introduced the fourth dimension to the visualization by a slider widget representing time. One can see that initially Euler and Goldbach mostly corresponded about mathematical topics. Later, they also discussed technical and private topics. We see that most of the Euler's correspondence about astronomy was in 1748 at the time of Euler's breakthrough in this field. There were periods of pause in their correspondence and over time their correspondence shifted more towards private matters. To study a letter closely, users can simply click on its note. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much and thank you for keeping to the time. I know it's not it's not always very pleasant um, when you hear that you only have two more minutes. Thank you, Sepida. Um, we shall now move closer to home um, and I will shortly be giving the floor to my um, colleague Vicky Dritsu from DCU Athena Research Center alongside with Maria Elvanidu um, they have prepared a paper on um, the integration of archival materials for the study of the Greek 1940s. Um, Vicky will be giving the presentation. Um, if, if she's ready, she can share her screen. We can start. Uh, so hello, hello from Athens, from Greece. My name is Vicky Dritsu. Uh, I'm an information scientist uh, working at the Digital Curation Unit of Athena Research Center. And uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity on uh, presenting our work on integrating archival materials for the study of the target in Greek 40s um, within Apollonis. Apollonis is the infrastructure that is actually the conjunction of uh, Daria and Clarin here in Greece. And uh, within Apollonis, we have formed together with other partners, a task force that aims to uh, test our digital methods and tools uh, using real case scenarios and real data. Uh, what I'm about to show you today with, uh, throughout this presentation is uh, a teamwork, an ongoing work that has been um, carried out uh, by the DCU and all my colleagues are mentioned here on the left side. Um, so for the for the case of the real for, for the real case uh, scenario, uh, we have chosen uh, within the task force to study the Greek 40s uh, due to the significant historical events that took place during this period in Greece, and um, of course we wanted real data to test our methods. Uh, this data came from different uh, institutions, uh, different archives that uh, we have acquired. Uh, here you can see the number of uh, records that we have in total in hand uh, at about 92,000 uh, records coming from six different archives that are mentioned on this slide. What we aim to do now uh, with this scenario and this data um, our aim is twofold. First of all, we want to assemble and integrate all the digitized archives. Actually, we have the metadata of the archives and not the real, um, the real records on, in our hand. And uh, then enable their joint indexing so people can search for information uh, using specific criteria. These five criteria, uh, we have decided to be actors, places, time, topics, and events. Um, on the other hand, um, we also aim to identify all the required activities, all the digital curation activities that we have to carry out, record their workflows, and then share them with the research community um, so that researchers can repeat the same procedures using their own data and so uh, become a repeatable um, process. I have uh, created here a, a map, let's say an overview of the of all the digital curation activities that we have carried out, starting from the acquisition uh, to the final date of publication. Uh, some of you may see some similarities with the uh, scholarly primitives that we discussed on Tuesday as well. Um, and I would like to give just uh, a few details on each activity that we performed. 
uh, starting from the acquisition and the initial data processing, of course, all, all this um, all this uh, information, all this data came in different file formats uh, that uh, required to be transformed. Uh, we have multiple, we have uh, performed multiple uh, transformations from different file formats mentioned here. And finally, uh, we produced CSV files, um, which are user friendly and all, um, all users, even non-experienced, could work on them. The next step we performed uh, was to clean this data. Uh, as you can assume, uh, there were common problems uh, within this data, typos, uh, abbreviations that had to be uh, checked or even corrected. Uh, for this uh, purpose, we have used the open source tool Open Refine. And uh, here is an example of a replacement, of a replacement that we have uh, made instead of nine um, of nine values that contain errors, we just replaced, uh, we replaced them with a the correct uh, value that is shown at the bottom. On the right side of this slide, you can see also the specific workflow uh, that we have followed in order to perform this activity. And throughout this uh, presentation, you will see these workflows as we have recorded them uh, on the right side of the activities that I'm describing in this time. So we have our data cleaned and in a unique format. What we do next, we next uh, we then have to create a common schema. Uh, we have to get a uh, read of the, of the heterogeneity that is contained within uh, this data. And we need a specific common metadata schema under which all this data will be structured. For this uh, purpose, we have uh, we have selected the EDM schema, the Urbana data model, so uh, that we can express all data with this underlying uh, schema. It doesn't move on. Okay. Next, our data was transformed into EDM. Um, we had to perform uh, these transformations by developing uh, scripts for its collection, for uh, its archival collection, one script for its collection. And the output of this procedure was um, uh, were XML files, one XML file for each record that contained in uh, the, each archive. Uh, till now, we have completed the 19.67% of the transformations from the acquired records. Uh, so we are almost uh, complete with uh, the transformations. And um, having the XML files in hand, we, just, we then continue to aggregate this uh, using the more aggregator that we have previously developed here at DCU. Uh, these XML files were ingested into more, and uh, we have built on top of them indices using the elastic search based on the five criteria, five basic criteria that I've mentioned uh, earlier. Um, again, 99.67% of the um, of the of the data have been uh, used in these indices. So four out of five indices have been completed. You can see here um, the statistics, the, the numbers regarding actors, places, times, topics, and events, how many entries and how many distinct uh, unique values have been populated into the indices and can be queried. Uh, users can exploit this information, can search this information using the interface. Here's a screenshot of the interface we have developed and uh, that is contained within uh, our portal, uh, of the Apollo in, within the Apollo Linux portal. Um, we believe it's a user-friendly interface, so even non-experienced users can easily use it and um, uh, enter their keywords regarding the specific indices or all of the indices that they want to exploit. Throughout this work, um, we have also observed that there were some text, uh, free, uh, free text metadata fields that contained important information that was not annotated and uh, that we wanted to uh, take advantage of. And um, 
make it publicly available uh, with uh, the, the appropriate field, fields. Uh, this is the reason why, uh, in collaboration with the Institute of Language and Speech uh, Processing here at Athena Research Center, we have decided to apply natural language processing methods. And you have, we have used uh, Yumaruta uh, rules, the Yumaruta language uh, rule language. Um, which um, actually led to the successful uh, identification of actors, topics, dates, places, and document types. Uh, on the slide, you can also see the number of entries that we have successfully identified and which we uh, treat from, our, from this point on as enhanced knowledge um, in terms that it is not, uh, it doesn't come from the original fields that uh, the institutions provided us with, but is the knowledge that we have uh, created by using specific uh, methods. To organize this information, we have decided to keep it uh, in a separate, um, in a separate, let's say, um, search engine, no, it's not search engine, in, in a separate place uh, and create a semantic graph. So we keep the indices and uh, that have been uh, aggregated through the more aggregator uh, with the original data that came from the providers and the enhanced knowledge that came uh, together with the, uh, the original data uh, will be populated, is populated actually, has already begun into a semantic graph. Um, this is the way, by this way, we can also explore the semantic relations uh, between data that come from different sources and uh, from different providers. Vicky, you have two more minutes. Thank you very much. Of course, we needed an RDF schema for their semantic representation. Uh, we have decided uh, that CDOC CRM will be the base for our semantic schema, the known standard. Uh, we had to make some additions to it, uh, just a few additions, so it's, it is an enhanced CEDOC CRM. And uh, all the data that we had, the original and those that came up, that came after the NLP methods, um, was programmatically expressed into RDF triples. We then loaded this outcome into a Neo4j graph database. Uh, which looks like uh, that, for those of you that are not familiar with uh, such graph databases, on the right side is the graph view of exploring specific resources that have been uh, populated in the graph database. Uh, till now, we have, um, we have uh, populated, we have ingested at about 230,000 RDF triples. And we expect them to be at about a million triples by the end of this uh, process. And this semantic graph serves for performing queries that uh, have a higher complexity uh, as well. Um, uh, people, users can choose different parameters and even pose complex queries on the semantic graph. Uh, there is a drawback when using such uh, graphs. Uh, the drawback is that um, users need to be experienced in RDF query languages because um, not all users know how to perform such queries directly on a, on a graph database. Um, to face this drawback, we have also expressed 14 frequent research queries in uh, SparkQL. Uh, these are currently also expressed in Cypher that is used on top of uh, Neo4j. Uh, here are two examples of such queries uh, so that researchers can repeat them, can use them directly to query the semantic graph. Um, you, should be, you should be wrapping up. So. Yes, and these are the frequent queries all expressed in natural language. I just wanted to uh, introduce you and, uh, and um, give you the URL of our alpha version of the decade 1940 uh, topic. Uh, this is the URL of the alpha version that we have developed. Unfortunately, it is only in Greek. And of course, as our work is still ongoing, we are open to collaborations. Thank you very much.